Okay, so we're gonna talk about uh, wastewater processing. So this is actually an aerial photo of where you're, um, where we're gonna go. And um, so actually you can maybe see here on the, this is the uh, entrance right here. And uh, if you're driving over there, the office, I think the office is right at the end. It's other than that, it's like right about here. And you can see there's a bunch of parking right here. So i uh, just give you an idea of exactly where you're going when you come in. So I'll come back to some of these pictures and we'll talk a little bit about the processes today. Uh, I think I showed you this map before and uh, I found another uh, piece of data here that said wastewater treatment levels in Canada. So again, this is older data, um, but uh, I imagine, you know, there's a little bit of changes over the last few years. Uh, I think I did find some information about Halifax uh, in that the wastewater treatment center opened up in 2008, I believe. And that's obviously was a major improvement because before that they didn't have anything other than pipes out to the ocean. Um, and, uh, but you can see what they're, what they're talking about here. And we'll talk about this today is different types of treatment, right? So you can see down at the bottom, you can see where they're talking about septic systems, tertiary, secondary, primary, and no treatment. So it kind of goes in this direction, right? No treatment is red, meaning bad. Primary treatment is very basic. Secondary treatment is, uh, is what we're striving for minimum in every community in Canada. Uh, and tertiary treatment is, is even better. Um, and most uh, new plants have some form of tertiary treatment. And we'll talk about what all that means here. Uh, hopefully we'll get to most of it today. Interesting, no data in 2001. I always wonder what that means. So uh, let's just talk about um, sewage in general, uh, something that I kind of meant to talk about last day uh, when we were talking about um, wastewater characteristics is uh, I think I mentioned that most sewage is basically mostly water, right? About 99.9%. .9%. So that means if you have a liter of water, uh, it's about one gram of, uh, of impurities. So it's not that much. If you compare that to like, like seawater, uh, seawater is 96.5% water. And so it actually has more dissolved solids. Um, what would you rather drink? Probably neither. <laughs> uh, but, uh, you know. Not, kind of, not unless you can safely like uh, filter out the pollutants or boil yeah. it. Exactly, yeah. Uh, so which is more polluted? It kind of just depends on what you mean by polluted. Uh, salt water has, uh, it has more, more solids. Um, and uh, drinking, you know, that amount of salt is, is not going to be good for you. But, I, but you know, either way, don't, don't drink either, I guess is, is what I'm saying. But, you know, what, what pollution means is a matter of perspective in terms of what you're, what you're looking at, right? So a lot of this is just water. And, uh, but we do want to clean up that other, you know, small percentage. And I also showed you, showed you last day um, these values in terms of what you're looking at, right? So, you know, your wastewater, we have... Uh, uh, suspended and total solids, um, you know, relatively high. And uh, in Fort McMurray, they're trying to get down to 10 milligrams per liter or less. Um, so that's that's pretty small, right? Um, so they got a lot, a lot of stuff to get rid of. They got to get rid of ammonia, phosphates. Uh, they're reducing the fecal coliforms going from uh, what's 10 to the 8. That's 100 million uh, to a billion or so uh, per liter, uh, trying to get it down to less than 200. Per, um, per milliliter. So that's a lot less. So we're trying to get rid of a lot of junk out of there. Uh, this is just more details in, into what um, uh, that previous slide. So uh, the other thing is temperature, which I mentioned before, which I don't think is usually a big deal, but uh, something I was gonna ask, actually ask them this, this year, whether they have to do any temperature adjustments. So um, goals. Probably pretty obvious, uh, but there's two things in there. There's organics, which is actually the biggest thing. Uh, and there are inorganic materials as well. Um, there possibly are toxic things in the water. Uh, you know, by, by that, I mean, you know, heavy metals and whatnot. And obviously, you know, meeting government standards. Um, the targets for wastewater treatment. Uh, in most cities, we're dealing with sewage from homes and uh, businesses and whatnot. Uh, sometimes there are industries, uh, some industries, I think I mentioned before, have their own treatment, uh, smaller industries. So, you know, small things in town, laundromats and restaurants and those kind of things. Uh, we're dealing with their water. And in some places, uh, there is wastewater treatment for farm waste as well. 
So we'll kind of, you know, uh, touch on the farm waste a little bit. So you can see here uh, what kind of methods we're going to use. And uh, the big ones actually are physical and biological. Uh, we don't actually use a lot of chemical processes in wastewater treatment. Chemical processes are really common in, um, in drinking water treatment, uh, but the majority of the wastewater treatment is actually biological and, and physical. And so we'll, we'll see what all that involves. So here's the wastewater treatment plant uh, in Fort McMurray. This is the Google images, um, Google mapped satellite view. And uh, so I just wanna point out a couple of things that you're gonna see in your tour. So as I mentioned, you're, you're going in the office is right about here somewhere. Uh, if I remember correctly, I think this building here might actually be the lab. And uh, usually they bring you through the tour. Sometimes you see the lab first, or you see the lab at the very end. And uh, usually they bring you to the tour right over here to the beginning, which is the headworks. Uh, number five, by the way, is the composting. And so that part there, that's gonna be the smelly part, uh, particularly number one is the headworks, and that's where they bring in the water. And so you're gonna see the, uh, um, the gratings where they, uh, they bring uh, you know, toilet paper and all sorts of other, other things, uh, pretty nasty things can be in there. Um, Blaine, I have a couple of questions. Uh... Sure, uh, just we'll... give me a moment here. Uh, okay, okay. I was just gonna just finish saying a couple of things about the tour. Um, okay. And then usually they walk you outside, uh, you know, kind of along this way. I think, I can't remember whether we go around this way or whether we go up this way. And uh, you're gonna see all these things, number three and four, these are clarifiers. And uh, there's basically microorganisms in there trying to digest things and, uh, and the sludge is gonna be settling out. And then eventually end up with these big clarifiers. And at that point, the water is pretty clean. And then the last part of the tour, this is the UV room. And uh, that's where they hit the water with UV before it gets discharged to the river. So that's kind of the basics around the tour. Uh, so question? Oh, yes. Um, uh, yes, uh, Blaine, uh, are, are there, are there, are there, is it gonna be like loud in there? Are, are they gonna use any loud machineries? Um, there's somewhere, trying to remember exactly where, somewhere around here, they have some, uh, some pumps um, and that's the only loud part. Okay, the rest is fairly quiet. That's right, yeah. And I don't even know if they'll bring us in there because it's a, like a small room. So with, with COVID and, and distancing, I'm guessing they, they may or may not bring us in there. And, uh, but so yeah, it's just a small, small portion of the tour that's relatively loud. Okay, and one more question. Uh, will we, um, just out of curiosity, will we be like, well, is there like, uh, like uh, there's might that sound silly or something, but uh, is there going to be like a room where like they like accidentally catch fish or something? Like, <laughs> no, I've never seen that there. No, no. Or like any animals? Like, um, like I know it sounds silly, but yeah. I just, I'm just curious. No, I've never seen animals out there other than maybe birds flying by. So we're not going to yeah. see any fish in any of the rooms? No, no, not that I know of. <laughs> Unless something's changed. All right, just I'm just curious. Yeah, so this opened up in, um, I'm trying to think what year this opened up. Uh, it was a big deal. Um, before this, we had lagoons, and we're going to talk about what lagoons are, but uh, for some reason, I think 2015, but I feel like that's really recent, like it was maybe 2012 or something like that. But this thing has basically been open for less than 10 years, and uh, there's lots of room for expansion. You can see those numbers there. They're looking at processes about 30 to 52 uh, megaliters per day. Uh, currently the capacity is something like a hundred, I think. Um, and there's room so that they can, there's a lot of property there. So if they needed to, they could expand and, and, uh, accommodate apparently 130,000 people, uh, if, if Fort McMurray, um, you know, and we could even expand for more if Fort McMurray ever did get bigger. You know, when I first moved here, there were rumors that Fort McMurray was going to be a quarter of a million people eventually. Um, I don't know if that's true or not, but um, it could expand, uh, you know, to over 100,000 probably in the next 20 years. It would not be uh, unseeable. So let's talk a little bit about the treatment processes. Like I said, I want, there's, there's kind of different uh, categories in, in, uh, in the industry. They talk about uh, uh, primary or preliminary treatment, uh, secondary treatment, tertiary treatment. Uh, solids treatment is sometimes uh, its own category, although it's, it's sometimes included in those other ones. I'll show you a little bit more detailed breakdown before we talk about these. So primary treatment, 
is uh, kind of that initial screening and sedimentation. So when the wastewater comes in, uh, you can imagine, you know, people are flushing toilet paper and other, uh, other things that can all get screened out. And uh, they're just trying to get the water. There's also some settling that happens. And so they often call that grit removal. Um, so there's going to be gravel and uh, uh, other things that, that is found in the wastewater because it's going through all the sewage pipes and it's picking up, uh, picking up things like that. And so that's really just the initial primary treatment. Uh, it's not much. Like I said, you know, we want to certainly do better than that. The, uh, the secondary treatment is, uh, like I said, it's mostly biological, uh, meaning what you're trying to do is encourage microorganisms to basically eat the organics. And then the microorganisms are heavier than water, and so they will settle out and become sludge. And that's the whole idea. And so you have small organic molecules get consumed from the microorganisms. The microorganisms settle down uh, to the bottom of, um, of these clarifiers, and then um, you can treat the sludge. Uh, and the sludge can be composted or disposed of, and uh, kind of depends on where, where you are, what you're doing with it. But a lot of places are doing composting to some degree now. And uh, that's something I want to ask them a lot more about uh, when I go on the tour myself. I'll tell you a little bit about their composting efforts um, when we get to those PowerPoints. Uh, and then a lot of places now are also adding tertiary treatment. So tertiary treatment usually means is you're making the water um, you know, potentially usable for something else. So it could be drinking, it could be agriculture, it could be some industrial process or something like that. And uh, so we have, uh, we have UV treatment, which kind of falls into the tertiary treatment and also disinfection, uh, which is, uh, like I said, UV treatment is a pretty cheap and easy add-on and, um, and, and why not if you can do it, right? So we'll, we'll talk about all those things too. So this is kind of a layout of um, kind of a typical water treatment plant. Um, just want to point out a couple of things here. So you can see we've got over here, this is the, the raw wastewater coming in and there's gonna be some pumps. There's some grit removal and some settling that's going on. You can see the sludge is going down here. And uh, so depending on the, on the treatment scheme, some of, that, some of that stuff just goes directly to a landfill. Sometimes it's composted. And then the secondary treatment is here. Like I said, it's biological. We have both aerobic and anaerobic. So you probably remember those words. Aerobic means with oxygen. Anaerobic means none. And then this tertiary treatment over here, you can see in this scheme, they're actually using chlorine. Um, we don't like to use chlorine usually in wastewater treatment because usually we're putting the water back into the river and you can't dump a bunch of chlorinated water into the river. But some places do use it. They chlorinate it and then let it sit and, and then um, dechlorinate it and then eventually let it go into the, in, you know, back into, the, uh, into nature. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about each of these processes. There's different ways to do it and, and every place uh, that you are um, is gonna have a little bit of a different design. So here's the, the primary treatment. You can see we've got these gratings. Um, usually there's some big ones uh, initially to sort of large material. Um, sometimes you'll see skimmers. So I think uh, if this is the correct picture, I'm thinking of these skimmers, uh, a lot of fat and grease will, will kind of be floating and uh, it can be kind of skimmed off the top with these little scrapers, and, uh, and that's just going to be removed from water. Uh, this is the Headworks uh, screen uh, that you're going to see at the, at the wastewater treatment plant. Uh, I'm not exactly sure how this works because I've never seen it turn on, um, but if you take a look, there are little gratings in here, and so it uh, basically squishes the water out and takes out the solids, and this is actually one that's just been cleaned. But if you saw one that wasn't clean, this would be full of uh, mostly toilet paper. Um, you know, you can ask them if they've ever seen any unusual things there. Uh, I'm always picturing dentures or toothbrushes or something that might fall into the toilet, but I'm not entirely sure whether they would see them there or not. I think the guy said he found a rubber ball once uh, in there. So you never know if you have kids what they're going to put down the toilet. I know I had to, uh, almost seems like a cliche, but uh, I had to get a, a rubber ducky one time. So um, usually after this, we have some clarifiers. So we talked about clarifiers as well. And uh, you know, there's all sorts of different designs of clarifiers and drip tanks and things like that. And, and uh, the whole idea is to basically somehow let, let the thing settle. So this clarifier here, you can see has a bit of these little paddles at the top and um, these little paddles kind of, uh, you know, bring the water in and, and push it slowly. 
And uh, you can see at the bottom, there's also paddles that are basically gonna push any of the saddle sludge uh, into uh, basically some sort of sludge pump and, uh, and separate it from the, um, from the water. Uh, I'm not sure where the outflow is here. Uh, I'm willing to bet the outflow is probably at this end. If the water's coming at this end, the outflow is probably over there. And as the water kind of flows gently this way, the solids are gonna to drop to the bottom. So here's uh, one of the primary clarifiers uh, in Fort McMurray. This one uh, looks like it's mostly empty. Uh, I can't remember taking this picture now, but I must've taken that picture, but it's basically same design as what I showed you before. And you can see there's a kind of a different diagram here. You can see the, um, uh, let's see here, the water goes in at this end and the water leaves at this end in this tray. And uh, this is pushing and you can see the, the sludge eventually goes into these, uh, these sludge pumps here. So just physical forces here, right? Uh, basically density and gravity are being used at this stage. Ah, there it is full. And you can see, uh, you know, um, these things, these paddles, they move relatively slowly uh, because we're not trying not to stir up the solids, we're trying to let the solids uh, settle. Another diagram, and there we go. You can see the paddles. And so you can see the water here, it's, uh, it's kind of cloudy. Uh, doesn't really smell that bad. Um, in fact, I don't remember there being any odor at this stage here other than the cold air. I think this was a cold day I took this picture. Um, and by the time you get to this stage, it's really not too bad. Somewhere in there, they're gonna show us uh, there is, um, there is a, a stage in there where they uh, do inject some air into, um, into the, the, the water. And I can't remember what they call it. They have a lot of acronyms out there. They call it DAF. I'm trying to remember what that stands for. Something about, oh boy, I think A is air, where they inject some oxygen in there and, and some of the solids will float and then they skim them off as well. So they might show us that as well. That's somewhere at the headworks. So there's some uh, former students and, um, and this is the tour guide and she's actually also a former student. So she's a graduate of the program. Like, I have no idea how many years ago because this was before oh, my mm -hmm. Are we going to also have to, gonna have to wear these sort of vests when we go there? Yeah, yeah, they give us all a vest uh, to, to wear. And um, they also have uh, safety glasses and goggles for anybody who wishes to wear them. Or yeah, and sorry, safety glasses and gloves in it. And what about helmets? I don't think we need to wear any helmets, do we? No, no helmets are required there. All right, just double checking. No problem. So as I mentioned, there's different designs of clarifiers. So here's a circular one. Uh, I'll show you some pictures of some circular clarifiers and they have uh, these circular clarifiers at the end. So they're all kind of the same idea, right? You can see you've got water coming in. So water comes in right here and it goes out here in this trough. And as the water gently flows towards the, uh, the outflow, um, the idea is that the solids will settle. And you can see there's a, a sludge pump here at the bottom. So those are all physical forces. And uh, yeah, so there's a, there's a circular secondary clarifier. Um, at, uh, so secondary means it's not the first step, it's a later step, right? And uh, at, in, um, that you guys are gonna see, and they'll probably let you walk out on it and, you can kind of take a look down there. And at this stage here, the water actually looks really good. Uh, it's very clear. Uh, and uh, in many wastewater treatment plants, this is the last stage and it goes out, out to uh, the environment after this. There's another picture and the parking lot in the background. Okay, so let's talk about the secondary treatment. This is the big part um, that's really important for cleaning up the water. And uh, like I said, most of this is biological in nature. And so the whole idea here is to, uh, we're trying to get rid of organics and phosphates and nitrates. And we can do this by basically encouraging microorganisms. Uh, we don't even have to provide the microorganisms because they're, they're there, they're in the sewage. You can imagine fecal matter is, is loaded with microorganisms. Um, sometimes if it's a brand new water treatment plant, they might seed it a little bit by getting some, some wastewater from another plant. Um, but generally it's not necessarily needed. And the whole idea, like I said, is to, to encourage the microorganisms to do the right thing. And depending on the temperatures and the volume of the water and all those kind of things, you know, these, um, these technicians, they have little tricks, right? They might need to add a little bit of heat, or they might need to add a little bit more oxygen or a little less oxygen uh, to get these things going. 
So I'll show you, I'll talk about some of these processes and you'll see some of them uh, when you go there. But if you think about this, um, the wastewater, like I said, it has these organic molecules in there. It's got phosphates and nitrates. And, and this is food for microorganisms. So like I said, we just want to encourage these things and allow the natural processes to speed up. Because wastewater will, you know, if I had, if I had, um, you know, let's say 100 liters of wastewater, if I, if I put it, you know, if I just dumped it into the river, it's naturally going to break down. Problem is, you know, the quantity when you have an entire city, right? Um, and so we want to speed this process up and so that we can safely deliver the water in the end, right? So you can see this includes aerobic and anaerobic um, uh, organisms. Um, so in some places, I don't think there are too many of these in Canada. They have these things called trickling filters. So if you take a look at this trickling filter, what you have in, in this case here is this large area, and it's basically full of uh, giant chunks of gravel. So big rocks, right? And, uh, and then they spray the water over it. And so the whole idea here is you have a whole bunch of surface area and the microorganisms, they're, they're going to uh, um, form biofilms on the rocks. And as the water trickles through, the microorganisms are going to uh, hopefully consume all the organics and, and nitrates and phosphates and those kind of things. And, and uh, by the time it gets through, we're talking about this thing is, is, a, is a few meters thick. And, um, and that's kind of the process. Um, the microorganisms eat the stuff. So you have uh, lots of air in there, you have lots of microorganisms, and that's pr pretty much part of it. So Canada, this is not the best idea necessarily. Um, these things would freeze. Uh, so like I said, I don't know if these are used uh, very commonly in Canada any place, and they usually take um, a reasonable amount of real estate. Uh, so you can see these are, things are quite large, and uh, so they take a bit more space. Apparently, these also have problems. Sometimes they will attract, um, apparently they attract certain types of snails, which can, uh, you know, <laughs> get in there and, and uh, bog up the system. But uh, it's one way to do it. It's called trickling filter. So here's kind of just showing the design. And you can see the, uh, you know, basically the water will be spraying out of here. It trickles through and, uh, and then it's going to be uh, come out the bottom in the end. I don't really know a ton about these, whether they eventually need to be cleaned or, or how that works, but uh, um, you know, if anyone ever finds out, I, I'd love to hear about that. So in Canada, most places have, um, have basically these, uh, these tanks and uh, they call them activated sludge. I don't know why they use the word activated, um, but basically it means they're putting air in there. And uh, just, Air from the atmosphere, they pump, pump it through. You can see uh, in this in this uh, photograph here, it's it's bubbling and it's frothing. And uh, believe it or not, this water here looks more brown than the previous water. And the reason for that is because we're actually culturing micro, microorganisms here. So basically, if you take a look, what we have is um, you know the water comes in somewhere and and uh, it slowly is going to snake through this uh, kind of little maze like thing. And uh, microorganisms are going to be fed uh, air and, uh, they're going to, and whatever is in the wastewater, and, and hopefully they're, they're going to be settling out along that way. So the whole idea is, uh, you know, to, the, the changing directions allows a little bit of stirring and mixing, but not necessarily uh, making it too, um, uh, the mixing is not too much that they're going to, you know, stay in, in suspension, right? So what, what you do is you take the water out of this one, and then you put it, and then you, you put it into the next one. And, and by the time you do this two or three times, you're actually cleaning up the water a huge amount. If you take a look at the total dissolved solids and all the other measures, uh, you're actually removing a lot of the waste uh, from the water just by doing this. Uh, years ago, I saw this, um, there was some resort somewhere um, and they were talking about the wastewater system there. I think the resort, uh, can't even remember where I was learning about it, but it was somewhere in Africa. It was this nice little, you could picture this nice little tropical resort. It, it could have been anywhere, Mexico or whatever. And, and um, you know, talking, it, was, it looked like a very cute place. It was a promotional video or something like that. And um, I don't know how many people it, it, it housed, but it wasn't, wasn't too many. But they're talking about because they were so far off the beaten path, they had to do their own wastewater treatment. And, uh, and basically what they had done was they had uh, three ponds. So, you know, the wastewater go into pond A, and slowly trickle into pond B, and which just slowly pickle, trickle into pond C. And by the time I got to the third pond, the water was actually relatively clean. 
And this is the same idea, except for we're trying to accelerate that process by providing lots of oxygen. So I think I have a couple more pictures here. I thought I had a couple more pictures, but maybe that's the only one. That's one of the better ones. Um, this is kind of showing some of the chemistry that's going on, right? You've got your influent, that's the water going in. DO is dissolved oxygen. Bacteria, of course, consuming these organics and producing CO2. And the bacteria themselves can be eaten by larger organisms, protozoans, and they're going to consume oxygen and produce CO2. And, uh, you know, it's trying to show you that this stuff is going to settle out eventually. And so you have the sludge or flock, and that could be pumped out. And eventually the water gets cleaner and cleaner. So like I said, it's just a matter of trying to speed up the natural biological processes. Uh, this is kind of just another schematic. You can see the oxygen going in. You can see the settling happening here, and the uh, the sludge itself can be um, can be dealt with. And we'll talk about the sludge uh, in a minute. Uh, and you can see some of the sludge is actually returned to the system just to make sure there's enough bacteria of the right types that are in there uh, in in the water system. So I'm not sure what percentage they return and how exactly that works, but uh, they just want to make sure there are enough microorganisms in there. So um, you may have noticed this, this note about anoxic. So anoxic means anaerobic, by the way. Uh, anoxic means no oxygen. And so a lot of the sludge will go to a sludge digester. Uh, we do have a sludge digester in Fort McMurray. Uh, it's not very big. Um, some places have really big ones if they have a lot of fibrous waste. Uh, so we're talking about things like manure from, from, uh, from cattle. Um, to break down cellulose that's going to be found in all those plants is going to take uh, uh, a lot of uh, anaerobic processes. So the idea is this is basically um, a digester where you're not providing any oxygen. It sits in there and anaerobic organisms are, are going to break the cellulose down even more. So here's the fermenter in Fort McMurray. Like I said, it's not very big. And uh, this, um, this pipe is going to be venting off gas. And I think I have on the next slide. Uh, what kind of gas we're talking about. Let's see who's on the next slide. There we go. So the gas is uh, um, methane and CO2. Uh, depending on the process, sometimes there's hydrogen gas too. And you can't, you can't just vent this to the environment. Um, methane is a greenhouse gas and it's a lot worse than carbon dioxide. So usually they either burn it off uh, or in some larger cities, they're starting to actually burn the methane and use the methane to produce electricity. Uh, which can go back into the grid. And that's what they were actually doing in Edmonton. Um, they were talking about uh, recycling their methane, uh, uh, burning it to produce electricity. And apparently uh, it, it saves them about a million dollars a year. So I was like really amazed at that. Mm -hmm. uh, you're just burning it with oxygen. So you're just making CO2 and, and, uh, and water. Yeah. So it can be used sometimes for heating. Right, I think in, in uh, Edmonton, they're using some of it to make electricity and some of it to heat their sludge, right? Because um, sometimes in the winter, you know, they want to warm things up. The processes speed up a little bit, yeah. Uh, Blaine? Uh, yeah. What would, what would happen if you inhale methane? Uh, if you inhale methane, uh, it, it can be toxic. Um, so methane is what natural gas is made of. And uh, you probably know that it has an odor to it. And it's actually not the methane that has an odor. They actually add the sulfur um, to give it odor uh, so that you'll detect a gas leak. Because uh, I think, I, I don't know in small amounts, I don't know, but in large amounts, um, it can be, um, I, I don't know exactly what happens to your body, but I know it can be lethal uh, with gas leaks. So not something you want to inhale? No, not really. I mean, small amounts like anything are probably not gonna hurt you. Um, but, uh, you know, if you do have a gas leak in your house uh, or something like that, it can be, it can be very, very bad for you, which is, like I said, why they add the order to it to make sure we can detect it uh, if there is a leak. Okay. So this is just kind of showing that process, right? You've got these complex um, uh, polymers. So mostly, like I said, the big one that's hard to break down is cellulose. And cellulose is the fibrous part of plants, right? And uh, so you've got uh, these things get broken down into their components. So uh, cellulose will be broken down into sugars. Um, proteins will be broken down into amino acids and so on. And they can see that you've got these different processes. 
and uh, the making of methane is called methanogenesis. And these are actually done by uh, archaeal organisms, um, which is, which is uh, that unique domain uh, that's, that's different from bacteria. So um, just want to talk a little bit about these stabilization ponds. Um, I had called, uh, I had mentioned that uh, before in Fort McMurray, uh, we used to use lagoons. And uh, so a lagoon basically just means a big pond. Uh, they go by different names, stabilization pond or lagoon or whatever. And the whole idea here is the runoff um, or, the, or the sewage basically goes into a pond. And it sits there for a while. And again, it's all about the natural biological processes. So on a small scale, so a farm or a small town, uh, this can be done relatively easily and it works and it works really, really well. And it's really just the same idea. Here's, I showed you this picture here of a, of a runoff control on a, on a farm. Thought I had another picture here. Let me just skip ahead. Okay, yeah. So there's a picture of one of our lagoons. We have uh, still running in Fort McMurray. Um, so what they're doing with these lagoons is uh, sometimes in the spring, you can imagine with all the melt off, uh, they, can only, they can only treat so much water at one time. So sometimes in the spring, what they do when the runoff is uh, and the melt off is, is happening and they're getting extra water, uh, they put it in the lagoon first to sit there until they can um, bring it back into the main system for treatment. But uh, you might see them out there, they might point them out. I'm not sure if they'll have any, any water in them or not. And uh, there's a large scale one somewhere. I can't remember where this was. I found this picture on the internet. So you can see whole, the whole idea behind the lagoons is the same thing, right? You've got the water, it's gonna come in at one end. So let's pretend the water comes in at this end here. And you've got all the biological processes in the middle. It's gonna take oxygen to do so. It's gonna be powered by sunlight. And eventually the water will trickle out uh, on the other end. And like I said, they're highly effective. It's just the same biological processes, but they can be slow. And if you have a lot and large amounts of wastewater, um, you know, lagoons are going to take a huge amounts of real estate. And there's just a certain point if you have a city and a certain number of people that you have to uh, try to find ways to speed this up and have a proper uh, wastewater treatment plant. But like I said, a lot of small places still have these and uh, this is considered legitimate and, uh, and it works and it works really well uh, as long as it's controlled and the water is, uh, you know, they monitor and make sure they're just not... Uh, you know, um, like I said, one of the big things is all the water levels and those kind of things. And uh, of course, there these are processes. These can, things can freeze over, and that's going to slow things down in the winter. So advantages of these ponds: um, they're super cheap uh, and pretty easy to maintain, and they're actually high performance. Disadvantages, like I said, is just that you know their capacity is limited, and uh, um, that's going to be a problem. You're looking at mostly energy from the sun, right? So, like I said, you know, they'll probably talk about the lagoons a couple of times when you're out there, and this is what they're talking about. Okay, so a few more things to, to mention for today. Um, some considerations for biological systems. Is there anything there to talk about? So they might talk about this a little bit uh, on the tour. Is uh, You can imagine that um, variables are changing all the time, right? Some parts of the season, sometimes of the day, you're getting more water or less water. You've got different temperatures, uh, those kind of things. You know, I keep mentioning the spring runoff uh, where they're getting some of the storm water in the system. And that's gonna change, you know, things like the pH and whatnot. And so, so they're often, you know, they're monitoring these systems very carefully. And, uh, you know, they're monitoring temperature and oxygen levels and those kind of things. And, and the reason why this is important because they wanna make sure the processes are, are optimal. And this is the kind of thing that the technicians there learn, right? Is that, uh, okay, so, um, you know, they take a sample at one stage and, and what they might do is throw it under a microscope and, uh, and take a look and see what they see under there. And if there's a healthy amount of, uh, let's say, flagellates. Anyone know what a flagellate is? It's a protozoan with flagella. Do you guys know what flagella are? Yeah, I don't know what you learn in biology when away, so. <laughs> Um, flagella are uh, kind of like little tails on protozoans for swimming, right? So often they're called flagellates and, uh, you know, they're looking for a healthy amount of them in there. And if they think there's not enough, then that might mean increase the oxygen or it might mean increase the temperature or decrease something. Uh, and they kind of have formulas for doing it. Some places, I think the one in Edmonton, they have a system where they have uh, an anaerobic followed by an anaerobic. 
sorry, an aerobic found, followed by an anaerobic, followed by an aerobic. And for whatever reason, they found that that's most efficient in their system. Uh, and how much time is in each tank and whatnot is something that they're controlling all the time. And uh, it's the kind of thing that as, as, a, as a plant gets going, uh, they eventually figure out what is the optimal, way, most optimal way to do these things. And of course, they're measuring all sorts of water parameters, like how many, how much ammonia is in there, how many phosphates, total solids, and so on. All those things are being measured along the way. So there are um, uh, there are sometimes uh, various physical treatments that are done in there, or or sometimes chemical treatments. Uh, kind of again, depending on the system. Uh, most uh, of the physical stuff that is done in, in Canadian wastewater treatment plants, like I said, is just the settling or the uh, or the gratings that happen. But there are sometimes other treatments that are done. You can see I have a couple mentioned here, like sometimes they will uh, filter with activated carbon. Um, I'm not aware of where they do that in Canada, but uh, you can imagine sometimes there are places where, uh, you know, the system maybe is not working properly. And so they have to, um, they have to get out extra organics that way. Um, and apparently I was reading that some places do use coagulants and uh, I didn't mention also chlorine, but not really that common that I can find out in, in Canada anyway. So let's see here. So let's talk a little bit about these tertiary treatments. Um, so like I said, the tertiary treatments are kind of, uh, you know, they're getting to be more popular and common, um, particularly the UV treatment. So tertiary, like I said, usually means you want to get the water and maybe make it good enough for something else. Not always the case. Uh, the UV is, is uh, super easy to install. And like I said, relatively cheap. Um, you're looking at a, you know, a shed the size of this classroom kind of building. Uh, and, uh, and, and so it's not, not very expensive and uh, it helps them to reduce their, it helps them reduce their fecal coliform numbers, right? So it's the very same process as what you see in the drinking water plant. You've got these strong UVC lights and, uh, and it's basically hitting the water and it's, uh, it's destroying their DNA. So it's not killing them necessarily, uh, but since their DNA is getting damaged, uh, they can't replicate and, uh, and therefore um, they're kind of, that's kind of the end of the story for them, right? Um, like I said, some places are apparently using chlorination, but uh, you have to dechlorinate the water before it can go to the environment. So this is not uh, a popular method. Um, and uh, my understanding is the UV treatment is actually far cheaper because you're not infusing new chemicals all the time either. The final the picture, there's the UV place um, at the wastewater treatment plant here. Um, you can sort of see it there at the bottom. It's kind of glowing, right? So the water is actually flowing through there, and they're they're not going to open this up because um, you know that light is going to you know damage your eyes and stuff. So we can't just open it up. But uh, we get to see the room at least, and and you can hear the water rushing through. And like I said, that's basically the last stage before the water goes back out to the river in form of mud. So there are lots of um, other tertiary treatment systems. Uh, some places filter their water at the end. And I kind of want to talk about this filtration for a minute because this is something that's gaining a little bit of uh, popularity in some places because they're realizing that um, you've treated all this wastewater and the water is pretty clean near the end. And um, it's cleaner than the river water. So, and then we're just dumping in the environment. And there are a lot of industries that would love to have that water. And uh, so we have, um, they talked about that, that there was some goals at one time to install a filtration system in Fort McMurray. And uh, this is showing a bunch of different types of filters. And um, the filtration system that they talk about a lot is this one here, it's called ultra filtration. So if you take a look at this, this ultra filtration, it's pretty good at filtering out not everything, not everything, you can't get really small molecules, but you can get out a lot of things like carbohydrates, you can get out um, all sorts of dusts and particles and clean up the water even more. And I'll show you, I have a picture of, um, of the filtration system used at Gold Bar. So Gold Bar is the main water treatment plant in Edmonton. I was lucky enough to actually get a tour a few years ago. And I'm not exactly sure what year this was installed, but um, in Edmonton, I think you have a, let me just see if I have a picture. I do. So if you take a look, 
This is the Suncor refinery. So if you ever drive in Edmonton and you go uh, on the east end down the Henday, you probably see that Suncor area. It looks like uh, this big industrial area out of the X-Files. I'm sure every time I drive by there, they're hiding aliens or spaceships or something. It just looks crazy with lots of lights and weird things going on that I don't understand. Um, but it's, it's actually not very far from the wastewater treatment plant, which is right here. If you take a look, you can see there's some, uh, some clarifiers. That's where they have activated sludge and so on. There's some more clarifiers and so on. So it's actually not that far from the Sun Core refinery. So I'm not exactly sure what the time frame was, but I think it was about 15 or 20 years ago. Suncor, they need water and they could take it from this river and they'd have to purify it. And uh, I think they said the estimated cost for building uh, the water treatment plant at Suncor was about $55 million. And then they realized that um, maybe they could take this wastewater and save themselves some money. So what they did at the gold bar plant is they installed this ultra filtration. So Suncor paid for it and I think it was $15 million. It's a huge amount of money saved and they take this wastewater, they put it through this, uh, this filtration system. So it, it kind of looks like straws. And um, my understanding is, is kind of how it works is that, um, so just picture straws with very, very, very tiny holes in them, right? So the water comes out and uh, what's, what's, or so the water goes into the straws and uh, the, um, the, the, the small particles, anything larger than 0 0.04 microns. Um, so that's pretty small, that's 40 nanometers. So that's gonna, it's gonna take up most large molecules. Uh, like I said, a lot of dissolved ions are gonna stay in there, but most other things are gonna get filtered out. And they're getting super, super clean water. Uh, at Suncor, they still put it through reverse osmosis as a final step, but basically that water gets piped. I think there's actually a little water pipeline under the river uh, that goes directly to Suncor. So Suncor has saved themselves millions of dollars uh, the city of Edmonton has a state-of-the-art wastewater treatment system they can advertise and tell people they're amazing. It's kind of a win-win in a lot, of, a lot of cases. And saves, like I said, saves a lot of water and, and, and uh, saves a lot, of, um, a lot of resources in the end. So it's pretty cool. And they show us the water and, and uh, they did show me some, some, re, you know, some uh, uh, parameters in terms of total dissolved, dissolved solids and things like that. And it's cleaner than tap water, which is pretty incredible. Um, there are a lot of places that are using these systems and they literally are making it for drinking water. There's a company in Singapore. Uh, I think I mentioned Singapore before is an island. Um, they don't have a lot of water. Uh, you know, they don't have any natural lakes. I think initially Singapore, my understanding was a swamp back in the day. Um, but there's a lot of people and they're trying to conserve water. So the, uh, the city, or whatever you want to call it, country. I guess it's all one thing, right? City, country. Uh, they they take this water and they treat it. It, it goes to a lot of industries, um, but it also goes into bottles for people to drink. And so, if you go to Singapore, you can buy this water. It's called New Water, and um, it's uh, it's totally drinkable. I think they put it through some reverse osmosis as well and UV, just as an extra precaution. But basically, it's this ultra uh, filtrated water, which is pretty cool. Uh, apparently, they're doing this in Phoenix, Arizona as well. Um, I don't really know how this works, but apparently there's farmers there. I don't know. I've never been to Arizona, but I've seen pictures. It seems to me it's just one big giant desert. So I don't know what people are doing farming there. <laughs> uh, but same idea, right? Um, the farmers, I guess they've decided this is a source of uh, clean water. Uh, and so um, as a result, they've installed this ultra filtration that gets sold to, to farmers. <laughs> I don't, like yeah. I said, I don't know if they're actually farming there, but. In, in Arizona for trees, they have like these buds, but you have uh, a lot of cacti there. Yeah, yeah. My sister has been there a few times and, and, and almost every picture has a giant cactus in it. <laughs> you should, maybe maybe one restrictions up, you should go to the desert, Blaine. I would love to go to Arizona. Um, after my sister, I think she's been there about four times now, and uh, it just looks like it's a wonderful place, you know, lots of great hikes and, and um, you know, some very uh, interesting ecosystems. I'd love to go. The, the winter is a good time to go down because the scorpions are hibernating. Yeah, for sure. It's kind of on my list of things to maybe do, you know, like I would love to. We'll see one of these, uh, maybe one of these reading weeks, I'll, I'll be able to make it there when when all this pandemic stuff uh, cools down. Or probably just go during the summer vacation break. Yeah, I like the winter idea. 
<laughs> so um, we're almost out of time, but I just wanted to kind of flip through and talk about solace treatment just for a second. I'll show you a couple of pictures here. Um, so in Fort McMurray, uh, we have that sludge and that sludge uh, gets dried up and they call it cake. <laughs> I don't know why they have that, uh, that, that word, but uh, they mix it with something called, they call hog fuel. So hog fuel is basically sawdust. <laughs> so I don't really know a lot about composting. Uh, my brother has one in his yard and he tells me, you know, adding certain things is good, like adding nutshells and leaves at certain stages are really good. And I guess it's probably serving the same purpose. You know, it's giving a little bit of cellulose, uh, probably uh, provides spaces and oxygen in there. But like I said, I don't really know a lot about composting. Uh, but yeah, they compost it. And um, they've, uh, I don't know whether it's a mini company or whatever, um, they call it Northern Roots Compost. And, and actually this website I just found out is, is defunct. So I don't know what's happening there because it was only two years ago they were starting to sell this. And um, there was an area near Fort Mackay where they're using to fertilize uh, a reclamation area. And um, uh, it's, uh, and one of, the, one of the workers there says she brought a bag home and, and her, uh, her rose garden is, is amazing. Um, and um, anyway, we'll talk more about composting next day because of course, like, it's kind of a weird concept to think about composting with, with human waste, but uh, if you do it right, it's actually, if you think about it, it's just like using animal compost. It's actually a rich source of, uh, of nutrients and so on. Um, so we'll talk a little bit more about that next day, but I just wanted to mention that's one of the things you'll see. And uh, some of it's outside, some of it's uh, inside. Uh, the inside part is, is, um, is the loud part uh, or near the loud part. And, um, it's uh, it's also a little bit smelly, but uh, uh, you know you're kind of mostly just walking through it. So anyway, um, we'll pick up this here next day. I'm sure you guys will have a different perspective on this after seeing some of it in person. Um, make sure you ask lots of questions on the field trip, and you know be polite and courteous. All that it goes without saying, and, and say thank you. And uh, I know the people out there; they most of them seem to enjoy their jobs. And um, I think you'll find it a pretty good experience. So that's where I'm gonna finish today. Uh, if you guys have any other questions or if your ride situation changes, uh, I need to know as soon as possible just to make sure that, uh, that we're getting in there. <laughs>